All right, well, good morning, Team ET. Welcome to a new week, and uh, great to have you here as usual. And as always, we have a fantastic guest with us, Mr. Steve Farrell. Um, Steve, welcome to the ET Project. Hey, thank you, Wayne. Great to be here with you. You've uh, you've recently released a, a book called The New Uni a new new a new universal dream. I'll get it out in a minute. Sorry about that. Um, and we're gonna we're going to talk through that book uh, during our conversation. But it's an interesting journey, and um, you know you go into detail about your career basically um, from start through to where you are now, and you know that spans what. I guess almost four decades. Yeah, yeah, actually over fifty years. It's a, wow. it's a, it's, it's a true story, right, from beginning to end. Yeah, it's a fascinating story, and I, I really look forward to unpacking some of the, uh, some of the details. So our listener base, as you know, are, are very much um, executives, leaders by another name, and uh, some of the journey that you had, particularly with your Silicon Valley businesses, but not only that, with your non non-profit organization that you've been involved with now for almost two decades. Uh, very interesting and very uh, informative for our listeners. So I look forward to this conversation. I wonder if we could start by sharing how did you get to Silicon Valley? What was it that brought you to that point where you knew that you wanted to be involved in technology and um, start a business? You know, I'll, I'll say it was an unlikely journey um, because I did grow up with a single mom, divorced mom, six brothers and sisters in very, very modest home. And then here I was 11 years later starting my first company in the heart of Silicon Valley, mm. absolutely in the right place at the right time. We grew it just massively. We started out as two, two guys, executive suite, used furniture. Uh, but uh, we were in digital communications as the internet was born. And so, boy, that thing just lit up. We, we grew it from zero dollars to 75 million over, over a 10 year time frame before we sold it to NEC, the Japanese conglomerate. And then inside of that organization, we birthed this other uh, organization that was in consulting with no products. And, uh, and we grew that one to 75 million in two years. So uh, and, th and then that gave me entrance into what I'll call uh, the club, you know, the this elite uh, group of entrepreneurs, leaders in Silicon Valley. Uh, I had Gavin Newsom, who's the governor of California, in my uh, 60 uh, person group. And uh, there were three chapters. The one next to me had um, Reed Hastings, who would we'd get together in, in groups and he hadn't even started Netflix yet. He he was actually uh, focusing on charter schools back then. So, and then there were other extraordinary people like that in my chapter mm -hmm. who I'd meet with mon monthly. So, and then as you know, uh, I detoured, you know, and went in a very different direction. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was it was it was quite an extraordinary thing for a, a middle kid growing up the way I grew up. Yeah, and it's such an interesting story. I, I can only imagine, and you don't go into a lot of the, the operational detail. You, you skim the surface of it in the book for obvious reasons, but I can only imagine the challenges that must have existed as a, as a, a young person yourself with, with your partner with a startup organization in such a dynamic environment with the internet booming, um, you know, you, you partnered with Cisco Systems early and, and that sort of really helped the growth. But what were some of the, the struggles and the challenges from a business point of view that you encountered early in the piece? Yeah, let me say this is one of the reasons I wrote this book called A New Universal Dream was right. to lay out all of the challenges that were along this journey and then my tools and techniques and processes for growing through those challenges and for uh for, for then growing these organizations uh as yeah. a result of things i was learning uh the other reason was to just talk about this conscious journey where there's a huge 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 opportunity for business today uh but so there's so many things i actually stopped throughout the book uh and i say boy 
this was a huge challenge. And this is what I learned. And I do that repeatedly throughout the book because this book actually was written for the reader. Uh, I wanted people to see where you grow up the way I did, just an ordinary, you know, middle kid. And then you find this massive opportunity and you've got to rise to that challenge. You have to grow into it. Uh, so things like uh, pr how to prioritize life, because I got way too business focused. I tell that story, uh, you know, about uh, my sister Marina in there, uh, how to uh, come into this place of being and not just doing. So this is yeah. like moving from the logic center of your mind to I'll call it the wisdom center of your soul. Uh, what that was like for me, how how I did that. And then miraculously, at least for, for, for my thinking, how my business took off yeah. when I did that. This was astounding because I was very concerned. I actually threw away my day planner, though I'm not recommending people do that. That's what I needed to do for myself. And in doing so, uh, my business then went into hyperbolic growth. So I growth. So I talk about that. Um, of course, you know, my own process for becoming conscious and what that means and how that works how as a leader that was working in the organization, how then I started recruiting people and I made lots of mistakes. So I talk about all these mistakes I made recruiting, but then how I came into uh, a process of recruiting that really did work. And then ultimately how to really inspire and grow an organization as a, as a conscious leader. So those are some of the things that I get into in this book. You touch on early in the book, you touch on, the alignment between your inner values and what you're doing and how that can lead to identifying that higher level purpose. I wonder, I, I know it evolved through the book to the point where you, you now are, but I wonder how do you start that, that part of that journey? Like many people go through the whole career without making that connection. I just wonder how how do you make that starting point? So let me let me speak to this uh, from a business perspective first, because it's, it's actually easy from this perspective. It is just you know when when you talk from the heart. Okay, sometimes people say you're that's your why, right? Where you just you're not there's no mask, there's no filter. You're just tell, telling people exactly the way you really feel, you know. So you you are talking from the heart. That is your why, of course. You're talking because your heart doesn't speak it on other, doesn't try and tell stories or or uh, make things up or or embellish things. Your heart's just going to go straight. Right. So uh, where we're talking, and this was what happened when I threw out my day planner and I started talking straight from the heart really listening well and really hearing what the person was saying, not being as so task centered the way I was before, you know, where I, here's your 15 tasks. How are we doing on those? Which was kind of what I was doing before. And then moving into this whole real talking, real listening, real hearing, uh, and then really speaking uh, from my heart. Uh, now where we do this in a, in a business context with our employees, with customers, with vendors, it's like magic, you know, uh, basically, because your heart is, is uh, wants to tell the truth. It's loving, you know, which is our, our basis when we talk about conscious business. Its basis is, and for that matter, conscious living. It's really just being a loving, compassionate, truthful person. And who doesn't want to do business with somebody like that or work for somebody like that? But I think you, from my takeaway from reading that area of the book was that you and and Rich, who was your partner in the business, um, took it to a higher level in that there wasn't an expectation for others to reciprocate. It was just a, a genuine desire to bring value to others. And as a result, there was a reciprocation. But it wasn't something you set out to get from the beginning. Is, is that a correct assessment? Yeah, no, that's right. It was really just exactly that. We weren't trying to become gazillionaires or or anything. In fact, we drew very modest salaries that we were paying uh, many members of our team much more than we were paying our, ourselves. Silicon yeah. Valley, top engineers, top salespeople, uh, you're reaching up into, you know, multiple, multiple six figures, uh, which we were not paying ourselves. So we were there. We wanted to create a great business 
uh, and uh, hire strong people, really do great work. We wanted to, we adopted a local high school. We were in South San Francisco, mm. where the local high school at that time uh, was just really resource poor, and their te- their good teachers were being drained off to other parts of Silicon Valley. So we came in and we were offering all kinds of resources for free, and it felt good. You know, of course, it, this is, I'm sure, what your listeners and, and viewers get to. It just feels good when you're building right. something uh, for the long term. You're helping organizations that need assistance. Mm. Uh, you're going to find success, and it's going to feel real good. I'm not sure that all companies have that um, that mindset. However, I, I feel that the majority of companies, and I'm generalizing, but I feel the majority of companies do something with an expectation of something in return. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk today in business about creating more value than your competitors, but also with the premise that that value is going to then generate that relationship, generate that um, business. But that wasn't how you started out. And as a result of that authentic approach that, that you guys had, it attracted the, the right people to the organization as well as the right clients. So, so it, it sort of comes from a different premise or a different platform and produces an even stronger result, which is quite an important message I, I found reading the book. Yeah, well, exactly. You know, and today I'll, I'll say something that uh, I don't know whether people would agree with or not, but, um, you know, so for me, uh, as they look out on today's world where we've got extreme weather, you know, in the United States right now, people may be reading in Western Canada, if there's horrible drought or smoke, uh, New York City, the mid, uh, mid-Atlantic mid states in the country are, uh, have terrible uh, air quality right now because of the smoke. This is all, and this extreme weather, it ties into, I believe, global warming. Uh, so... In today's world, if we can't uh, operate a business that has real meaning and purpose, it's really contributing in some way, you know, to a healthier uh, planet, healthier communities, healthier employees that we're looking after. Why do it? You know, uh, and again, I'm not sure every business person would say that, but that's just me and where I'm coming from. And what I can share is if we do come from that place and it's sincere and people feel that sincerity wow, you know, watch your business grow uh, because people are looking for businesses like this and organizations, as you know, I now run a nonprofit that's also growing quite uh, dramatically. Right. Uh, so whether it's a for-profit or nonprofit, an organization. So any organization that is really uh, tuned into today's world, we're wanting to make a difference, uh, taking positive action and where people feel that, you're going to attract uh, the best people. You're going to attract, uh, as you mentioned, you know, I was in the Bay Area where the Gap and a- even Apple Computer was our customer. We yeah. had uh, Spree, you know, some of the biggest organizations there in Northern California. Uh, we were also down in Southern California and even on the East Coast. Some of the largest organizations became our customer because they could feel, you know, a great team, great focus, trying to do the right thing, not trying to overcharge. Uh, and then today, you know, adding in the whole dimension of just really in today's world, uh, trying to just, uh, you know, uh, support this uh, this world that needs a little assistance right now. Right. You, you introduced a open book policy or methodology within the business at some stage. And I'm wondering, um, you, you talk about that really propelled your business again to the next level. I'm wondering, do you still adopt a similar approach, even though you're a nonprofit um, in today's yeah, world. We need to, so we're rated by the different uh, agencies, you know, that look yeah. at nonprofits. And uh, so you actually do publish your financials every year. Okay. Uh, and within the organization, we go down into exactly what's happening and including, in fact, especially during challenging times. So where uh, some of the, campaigns that we've got were a little different as a nonprofit. We're not relying a hundred percent at all on contributions. In fact, our conscious streaming platform for business and and, uh, individuals is where uh, 90% of our revenue comes from. So that operates, you would say more like a for-profit. Right. Uh, And so 
we do, we take people down into our financials, our cash flow, et cetera. Again, uh, what's there to hide? You know, I actually haven't been drawing a salary. Uh, I'm in a nonprofit here now. So uh, I haven't been drawing a salary uh, anyway. Um, and, and when you take people down inside the financials and really have them understand sales and margin and cash flow, et cetera, uh, they appreciate it. They'll work even, they'll, they'll even give more of themselves where they feel like, you know, you're an honest, uh, an honest leader. Mm, for sure. I'm wondering who, who influenced you uh, early in your career? Like, was there a particular um, business guru with their books? How did you stay motivated? How did, like, where did the influence come from? There, there were many books, uh, many leaders in there. Uh, there were some that, that were very spiritual. Uh, people probably have heard of Conversations with God, Neil Donald Walsh, who was actually the co-founder of the nonprofit that I uh, I lead. We co-founded this organization 20 years ago. Uh, and, and his books resonated deeply with me of this whole, uh, you know, spiritually that uh, there's not judging uh, going on or or these kinds of things that I grew up in the Catholic Church, where actually it's quite enlightened today under Pope Francis. But uh, back in my day, you know, it, it was a little bit uh, rough there. Uh, it was in terms of judging God and things like this. Mm -hmm. uh, in this uh, spiritual book of Neil Donald Walsh's, it's of, you know, it's actually saying that we're all one. Exactly what science actually is saying today. That's that's its own conversation, but. You know, in a, in a loving, supporting uh, uh, divine presence. So, but as well, uh, business books. You know, which I uh, I brought Seven Habits by Stephen Covey into uh, these organizations in Silicon Valley. I actually taught it during the uh, lunch hour. Right. Uh, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, because a lot of these principles, you know, uh, which talk about that we've got to really grasp it first, first things first. You know. Uh, are in those books that we can't build great things publicly, you know, have that public success until we achieve that private success first. Mm. And that private success is where we really, uh, you know, grow into really the best person that we can be. Yeah, for sure. If we, if we start to look now at the transitional period, and, and I say that as a period, but in fact, if I look at your journey, you were actually transitioning from an early point at Silicon Valley through to where you are now. So um, even though I can see there was a, a finite time around 2000, 2001, where you really stepped away from Silicon Valley and you started to focus more on the service to others as a, as a bigger topic for you, right? Um, was there a specific trigger that said, you know, the pursuit of wealth is not something that I'm now interested in. I'm more interested in the pursuit of humanity and helping humanity. Was there a, a finite time or was this a progression? So this, there, were, there was a progression uh, and that was, there was very much of a calling uh, let me share too, just so listeners and and uh, those watching this, yeah. you know, really kind of see the truth of what happened. Right. It was not like I had to go live in a cave with a loincloth <laughs> or something. Uh, you know, th this is the thing is, uh, especially for those that uh, are currently have a conscious organization or they're transitioning into a conscious organization. Mm. Uh, there's enormous potential uh, to create organizations that are going to grow into into massive influences in their community and out in the world uh where uh real financial wealth is is generated but uh but uh even more importantly from my perspective you know that we're 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 a positive influence in the, in the community in the world where where we wouldn't think of starting a gmo company or some media company that is uh creating trouble you know in the particular country that we're in uh, that may be going yeah. against democracy, for example. Uh, so so what happened to me is I was called actually there in the late 90s and in the early 2000s to this whole what science again is affirming now. Uh, some of your listeners, uh, some of those watching may be familiar with the with with the Nobel Prize for Physics, you know, for example, October of last year, 
or you had three uh, scientists that were awarded that for entanglement. And if you look up the definition of entanglement, it means that you've got two things on different sides of the universe with no, no physical connection at all that are affecting each other. So um, this whole, I'm sure all listeners also are familiar with that we're energetic beings, right? And that we want to raise our vibration. That's how we don't stay sick, you know, uh, yeah. that there's actually, it's an energetic universe and even that it's highly uh, interconnected and interdependent and even one uh, one energy, you know, which is the whole of the universe, the whole of the cosmos. So, and Einstein, Albert Einstein, that is, uh, that is when he, uh, transition there, uh, you know, 50 years ago or so. Uh, this was what he was working on, right? His unified field theory that said that everything in the cosmos and in the universe was was one presence and we're all actually faces of that one presence. Science is now uh, affirming all of this, saying it is in fact an energetic universe. That's how entanglement uh, is exists, uh, that we're all, you could say faces, 8 billion faces of that one presence here on this planet with the earth and other life forms on earth so uh so science is saying then what uh we were not told growing up when we went through grade school and high school and college we were taught right lucky sperm kind of met the egg boy did you get lucky you you know you, now you get to live this one life and then you go to bones and dust six feet under at the end of your life that's what most of us were taught growing up but uh this is in many ways uh today now a moment um you could call it a galileo moment you know people galileo of course was the father of science and astronomy back in his yeah. day and walked in this whole new whole new uh, theories belief systems of noah the universe isn't revolving around the earth you know we are revolving around a sun part of a larger universe uh and he brought in a lot of other science a lot of other astronomy uh and then he actually it did change the world you know those those uh beliefs his science, his research that came in. So likewise today, science and research are saying, you know, we're energetic beings, a part of this one, you know, this, this Carl Sagan thing that we're all made of stardust, <laughs> you know, that it's actually real. We're all a part of this one energetic presence. So I was called to, uh, um, I apologize for going long here in my answer, yeah. but it was called to uh, really, this is what we call conscious living in humanities team where we understand that we live into that uh and the basic thing that happens here when we live into it is we see our connection with the world around us and of course if we're mature people when you see your connection well you become responsible right just like the family i'm i'm connected to my wife and my kids so i'm gonna i have a certain responsibility and then if we are mature and we have a responsibility well we take positive action right it's just these are things we naturally do so likewise as the I'll call it the fence posts are moved out to the whole of the earth and humankind, eight billion faces, we do the same thing. I'm connected. I'm going to become more responsible. I'm going to take positive action. Can't do everything, but we can do something, you know. And then we're all called to our own station in life. So, so I was called back then to leave, sell my interests in business, leave those organizations, even leave Silicon Valley. I'm based now in Boulder, Colorado, and and just uh, work with others around the world on introducing this whole conscious living conscious business thing that is uh, really growing uh, quite nicely right now uh so that we can enjoy happier more fulfilling lives and and there's the whole microcosm macrocosm thing as we live happier more fulfilling lives and as enough of us do that we reach the malcolm gladwell tipping point you know where you get that four to eight percent all of a sudden, the whole world starts becoming healthier and happier. Uh, and we create that whole sustainable and flourishing world that we've all dreamed about. So long, <laughs> sorry for the long response. That That's what I was called to uh, back in that time frame and that I've been working on for the last 20 years. Right. So let, let's dive a little bit into the organization. It's called Humanities Team. And if, if I look at the mission, which is what you've been talking around, uh, in, in your answer just then was that you're, you're looking to make conscious living pervasive worldwide by 2040. So that tipping point, how, how far are we from getting to that point do you feel at the moment? You know, I, I think uh, I think the interesting thing is is that we're actually well along, uh, along this journey. Uh, 
because there's so many things that uh, are now out in the open. Let me give an example uh, to our business audience. So uh, regenerative agriculture is huge right now, huge, not just, I mean, around the world. So uh, there are organizations based here in Boulder that this is all they do. And uh, they just, a uh, group just came back from Portugal, uh, another group from Paraguay. Uh, and there's, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars now going into uh, regenerative agriculture, which is a form of conscious business where no longer is it about just producing uh, a crop, you know, with fertilizers and weeds, weed uh, pesticides and things. Yeah. Now it's the, the, uh, the quality of the soil, uh, the quality of the harvest, uh, water systems uh, there, uh, um, the, uh, the, the, the animal life that becomes involved in regenerative agriculture, you may know it, involves now animals that are actually roaming land and then uh, through their uh, droppings create fertile soil, which then creates uh, the harvest that is coming. So uh, the, there's, this, is, this is a huge conscious business right now is being led by agriculture, regenerative right. agriculture, but it's spreading into other uh, business forms too. Uh, so, and then in uh, conscious living here, there are many things. I'll just bring up one example that most people have probably heard of. Joe Dispenza uh, is, if you're on TikTok, uh, which you know is, is more in youth directions, but uh, he talks about where we're, he calls it creating in the quantum field, you know, instead of in matter. So without 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 just our hands and our day to day work, he's saying we're going to create in the quantum in the quantum field. And and creating in the quantum field actually goes back thousands of years. You remember, it was said, "It's done unto you as you believe." <laughs> that was said two thousand years ago. This is what creating in the quantum field is. I mean, watch Joe Dispenza describe this whole. Uh, quantum uh, cr creating in the quantum field. He's saying we're 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 feeling into a future we can taste, we can touch, we believe in, we desire that it's here now, right? It's not just we're not uh, we're we're not doing something of hoping that something can happen. Uh, we're actually believing, you know, and and standing in the truth it, of what is being created out in the future. Uh, yeah. So this is getting into energetic being kind of stuff that I'll go back to the what we grew up with in grade school and high school and mm -hmm. college. We were not taught anything, or at least I don't know anybody that was taught anything about creating in the quantum field or uh, <clears throat> metaphysics is actually what it is, uh, creating, you know, using metaphysics. Uh, this is a property of conscious living where we understand we're energetic beings and it really does work. We can we can actually create health and well-being in the world and in our households where we are where this is a regular practice and we're feeling it energetically into this whole uh home this whole community environment this world environment a regenerative agriculture where uh, now it's healthy foods you know coming from the land uh yeah. so this is something that's gone a quite big these are just a couple of examples there are many others that share that suggest that this whole conscious living thing where we're moving, uh, taking great strides toward moving uh, and to, to a whole new way of living on the earth. You talk about in the book, you mentioned some of the large businesses around the world like Salesforce and the leaders of these businesses starting to make this transition of conscious business. Um, you, you have a nice term, and I'm not sure if it's yours or who, who said it, but you talk about the death of shareholder primacy um, basically being replaced by now a focus on all stakeholders, which includes, of course, the, the largest ecosystem, which is planet Earth. Um, for us, at least, the largest ecosystem. So we, we can see the growth um, occurring within the business and hoping that our listeners are picking up on this transitional a shift because it, it's an opportunity, just like all businesses, to be at the forefront of that transition um, and to really help to drive and, and to make their operation more conscious and think about the impact that they're having and how can it be regenerative. Talk about that. So yeah. I think it's, yeah. it's a great story. 
Yeah, thank you. So that is near the end of the book. And that's right. They're business leaders that are out there today. Uh, Salesforce.com being one example. There are many where that we're driving in that direction now. The, I have no doubt this this is the future. And so you know what they say about uh, the future is you can be you can walk into it and be a pioneer and a leader in it and prosper or you're going to be dragged into it because the whole industry is going to go that way. <laughs> you want to be dragged into it, you know. So, and again, my book, A New Universal Dream. By, and by the way, you can go to a anewuniversaldream.com to, to read about the book and you see the yeah. first chapters. And I even give away my uh, $300 masterclass called Conscious Leadership when people just uh, send us their receipt number uh, for the book. It's a $19 book. Uh, and then it's a $300 masterclass. So it's a pretty good deal. Uh, and the reason we do that is we're a nonprofit and the things that we're talking about here now, Wayne, are the things that are uh, what are important to us is just creating these co homes, communities, a world that really works for everybody, you know, and where uh, we can really, th this is actually where we find the deliciousness and living, true prosperity. I tell the story in the book. Uh, I did not find that in Silicon Valley, that that we need some time to unpack that, but mm -hmm. I didn't find it, or I found it really doing the work that I'm doing now. Yeah. You have a initiative, I think it's called PACE, which is an acronym for Planetary Awakening Conscious Evolution. Um, what is the initiative focus on? I guess we've already answered the question, but can you build a little bit on that? Yeah, yeah, you bet. So what it does, it, it, it talks about conscious living uh, and gets into just specific things we can do. You know, our breath, uh, really creating stillness. Uh, creating time in the morning where we're uh, feeling into this this right. this this future that we're creating, including future businesses that we're, we've created and that we're growing, uh, where we're asking for guidance. So, because one of the uh, features of the conscious living is where we understand that we aren't alone. You know that we're you know in fact we're all one. It's you know or another what the scientists say is we're sovereign to one body. This is their science language. Uh, and that means that the body, the universe, you know, this omnipresence, omniscience, omnipotence is real. And we can, we can, uh, wisdom is there at our fingertips. We can ask for guidance. We're supported as we're doing these good works out in the world. Uh, so um, all of these kinds of things, you know, we, we get into uh, in this initiative pace, we get into ways that we can live concretely in, uh, in as, as conscious individuals and and consciously out in the world, even as as conscious business leaders, you can go to uh, changinghumanitiesfuture.com, uh, changinghumanitiesfuture.com, and and that initiative is described in some in some detail. And there's lots of free uh, resources there too. Yeah, great. There's a gentleman you quote in the book. I forget his name, sorry, but he talks about the transition from being Homo sapiens to Homo universalis. And right, right. of the expression, uh, essentially, if I understood it correctly, it means that we we shift from being materialistic beings to those focused on that bigger picture of humanity. Yeah. Is that correct? Exactly. We're, it's exactly right. We're growing into, you know, a new species. So our yeah. species is on this planet is uh, probably wouldn't surprise people. We're all a part of the current species, but it's a young species, you know, and we're going through. Uh, maturity now. And uh, as we mature as a species and start really understanding and living into this whole oneness thing or, or unity consciousness thing uh, that's real, uh, as we start really embodying that and expressing that, uh, bringing these these uh, processes into our businesses and organizations, uh, it's, it's just creating uh, really a much a much more beautiful way, more delicious way to live on the earth. And, uh, and also in the workplace, it's just, it creates a, a, a much more delicious way of working with others where you're really affecting positive change out in the world and where you've got customers and employees and vendors that all love it. And uh, you've got, they're, they're there to support your growth, your scaling. Mm. We, we, sh we have a mutual friend in Lance Secretary. What, what's yeah. the connection with you and Lance? Yeah, Lance is one of the leaders. So 
uh, in in this whole uh, transformational education thing and in, in conscious business. Uh, so he and I've been friends for for quite a number of years. We have in Humanities Team, we've got a streaming platform, a conscious streaming platform. Uh, it's called Humanity Stream Plus, and we have hundreds of uh, master classes on the platform. So it's a subscription based platform. Uh, it's about a dollar a day. You can go to Humanity Stream, uh, Humanity Stream org or dot net. I'm sorry, to uh, learn about it. Lance Secretan, who's a big business leader, is one of the people who has uh, classes, uh, transformational education programs on the streaming platform. So, and then others, you know, the Greg Braden and the Sim Harriman and Bruce Lipton and Lynn McTaggart and Michael Beckwith and Neil Donald Walsh. Again, hundreds of leaders have their programs uh, on this platform. Uh, Lance okay. is one of them. Le leader, business leaders, as well as leading scientists, physicists. Um, I was looking at, at some of the, the carousel uh, names and it's quite an impressive lineup, I have to say. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's certainly something I, I plan to check out and um, to look at and, and learn more from. So I'm excited to to hop on this journey and, and, and become more conscious myself. I think it's it's uh, something well worth pursuing and you know we're, we're heading in that direction. So let's get on the bandwagon and start to enjoy it. It's the future, you know, and it's a bright, bright new future. It really is. For sure. So, so Steve, um, if people want to connect with you and have conversation, is there a platform that's better than others or how would they find you? Yeah, you bet. So they can go to uh, the uh, a new universal dream .com, mm -hmm. and that uh, part of the Steve .org website, you can uh, connect with me there, reach out to, with whatever your interest might be. Uh, so, and then humanitiesteam.org is this nonprofit, 501c3 is called Humanities Team with a Y, humanitiesteam.org. Uh, so you can connect with me either way. And and I'll just share as we're uh, closing, boy, you know, let's just get these limiting beliefs out of the way uh, that are just not not uh, serving us and then really grow into our fullest potential. That's that's really what this is all about. Right. In, in the book, I know it's very um, practical and you can find a lot of guidance. Is there any um, tips that you could share or steps that you could share that people can sort of take away from our conversation today that they could already start um, to become more universal in their thinking, more holistic in their uh, approach? Is there anything you could share at the moment? You know, what? Uh, let, let me do this, suggest this. Because uh, I could give, I could, I could keep it on the level of just things that we could do day in, day out. But uh, some people could do. If you go to humanitiesteam.org, that's with a Y. At the top of the website, it says programs. Uh, click on that. There, then you'll see free programs. Mm -hmm. They're all these free programs. They're hour. They're an hour long by these scientists, by spiritual leaders, and body practices. All of these. Just look at all the free programs. Uh, go through a few of the free programs that really get into it because there's it, we have limited time here that'll get into a lot more depth and detail mm. than I can right in this moment. And as you mentioned, these are a lot of them are icons out in the world in this area of transformational education. Uh, and uh, during the free program, I promise you, you'll be taking lots of notes. There's all mm. kinds of things they're going to share about conscious living and conscious business. Right. Well, Steve Farrell, Incredible conversation. The journey has just really begun. Um, we're at we're at that. Um, I, I don't know if we're at that upswing point yet. Uh, let's hope we get there uh, in the near future, and uh, it, it's beneficial for the whole universe, <laughs> not only Earth but the whole universe. So I'm really hopeful we we all jump on board and we start to really embody some of these changes. And I think it, you and your team are doing a fantastic job so thank you for that and uh yeah really appreciate you coming on the et project yeah yeah thank you wayne for inviting me a pleasure to be here and uh boy godspeed to us all reach out where i can ever be of, of any assistance and 
again, I'm a huge optimist. I know in today's world, it might be hard to, to be an optimist, but I really believe we're well into this journey that we're discussing here. And uh, we've got a bright future. We all we all do need to play a role, you know, and that can't be just a few of us. So uh, let's get to that four to eight percent and create that tipping point and get it done. So what are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button below and click on the bell icon so I can pop up in your feed occasionally with a great tip for your ultimate group.